So is the base Mac mini M4 enough for Adobe Premiere editing? Well, in this video, I'm gonna give you my honest opinion. Now, I'm really fed up with all these other YouTubers that simply put a couple of clips on a timeline and then scrub through the timeline, and then they do a few exports, and they say, oh wow, it's pretty fast, maybe the Pro is a little bit faster. In this video, I'm gonna go into a much more detail and explain to you why I think the base Mac mini is not sufficient for Adobe Premiere editing and why you may want to consider a cheaper alternative using PCs. Unfortunately, this is the case. I don't wanna say it. I really wanted to love this Mac mini, but you'll see the results yourself. So this thing is so adorable. I really like it, but unfortunately it is not sufficient. Now, in order for this video to have any impact on you, you have to understand the context, how I'm actually gonna be using Adobe Premiere Pro. No, I'm not gonna be using Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve, and no, I'm not gonna be editing 6K or 8K raw footage from those really expensive cinema cameras. I'm just a basic YouTuber with 30K subscribers, so take my advice with a grain of salt. Now, I edit primarily with Sony cameras. Sony cameras are really great for solo content creators because they have laser eye, eye autofocus, and I also edit it with Panasonic cameras. And it was, they all share the same codec, whether it be H.264 or HEVC. HEVC is the more common codec, and this is what typically you would edit on your Adobe Premiere timeline. Now, of course, there's GoPros and Samsung phones, you know, iPhones and stuff like that, that are very common and very accessible devices for people who want to do content creation on a budget. And this is what the video is catered towards, editing those types of codecs or those types of footage that you would get from those very typical type of prosumer or consumer device uh, cameras. Now, no matter how powerful or expensive your computer is, whether it's the base Mac mini or the upgraded Max Studio, or like say the latest 14900K PC with a 4090 or 5090 GPU card, you probably still wanna use proxies when you're editing these types of inter-GOP codecs like H.264, HEVC. That's because it's very resource intensive to render these frames on these types of codecs, AGVC in particular. Now the terminology of this codec is called inter-GOP, which means that not every frame in the video file is a full complete image. What happens is that there's a keyframe, as you scrub through the timeline, it has to recreate the frame based off that keyframe versus intra-frame codecs, which have every image captured so it doesn't have to recreate it. This makes it a lot more easy, but it does take a lot more space. And you'll typically get that with codecs like ProRes. Now for this video, I'm gonna be comparing this Mac, base Mac mini with two of my PCs. Both have an Intel 11th gen top of the line CPU with an RTX 37 and 64 gigs of DDR4 RAM. Now, yes, it's an older computer from three years ago, but I did pay a lot of money around 3,000 Canadian dollars or 2,000 USD at the time. And it was one of the top of the line computers. And I would just expect that after four or three years later that the M4 processor with all its you know media engines and stuff like that would be a lot more efficient and handle or come close to the PCs. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So the first step is transcoding. In terms of transcoding ProRes, so if you're going to be making proxies with ProRes, which is the intra-frame codec, which is very easy on your computer to edit, but takes up a lot of space, this has hardware acceleration, whereas the PC doesn't, it has to use the CPU. But when it comes to decoding, both the PC and the Mac mini have hardware uh, decoders for HEVC or H.264. For on Mac, it's called the Video Toolbox. And on my computer, I have either QuickSync, Intel QuickSync, or NVIDIA's decoder for my RTX 3070. Now, all in all, after all my test transcoding, I'm gonna share a script and how I did this, but I did batch coding, serial coding, multi-threaded coding, and all that stuff, various codecs. For example, in one timeline, I was using my S23 footage from my phone. The other timeline I was using from, straight from OBS, which is over 200 megabit, very uncompressed footage, and then also from my camera. And what I've noticed is that overall, the PC still beats definitely beats the Mac mini in terms of transcoding. And this is an important part of your workflow if you have to transcode a lot of footage. Now, it's not by a lot, and honestly, it's not something that I would notice. I would say anywhere from 20 to 40%. In some cases, the Mac mini actually beats the PC when it comes to transcoding ProRes, specifically for my FX3 footage, going from FX3 HEVC all the way to ProRes intra-frame codec. Now, there was only one area where the Mac mini beat the PC, the three-year-old PC. I have this workflow where I capture all this footage, then I feed it into my own AI script, which edits out all the repeated takes and takes the final cut, and then it finally applies all those final cuts onto the Premiere Pro timeline. And this did it within like two minutes, super fast, very, very efficient. I think that's attributed to the single core nature of this task. It's just cutting one clip at a time really, really quick. Whereas my slower PCs like the Intel 
11700 and the 1085K, those PCs, they would actually lag and it would take forever. It would take multiple, like almost like an hour and it would just lag out and crash. On the longest clip, play open. Look at like how fast it is. Bam. This over here can't do it. This machine, the PC, but this one is super fast. So that's where the raw power of the Mac mini, the single core performance really annihilates the PC. Now in my intro, I said that a lot of YouTubers just take a couple of clips, maybe from different cameras, different codecs, and then they just scrub it across the timeline. And they watch this yellow green indicator on the timeline to see if there were any drop frames with Premiere Pro. That's not a very useful test because typically when you're editing and you're going through a timeline, you're going at multiple speeds, you're scrubbing through the timeline really fast. You have many, many cuts, layers, transitions, graphics, stabilizer, many stacks of stacks of timelines on top of each other. So this type of test is pretty much useless. You're basically testing that whether or not it can just play a basic footage at 1x speed. And of course, you know, your phone can basically play that at 1x speed. So it's a completely useless test. Another thing that really annoys me with mainstream YouTube reviews of these types of Mac minis and convince people to buy it for their editing workflow is that they use benchmarks, specifically the Puget Systems benchmark. Now, I do think that's a really good benchmark, but it, it doesn't really focus on the type of tools, what type of codecs you're actually using. It has a whole bunch of different codecs. Some, some of the stuff that you don't really care, like raw Canon AK footage or something like that. And that really is all compiled into, into the score. It also accounts for a lot of GPU effects and stuff like that. And maybe you're simple like me and just, you just want to have a really efficient timeline, apply some basic effects, maybe some warp stabilizer, some blurs, but not have crazy effects. So those benchmarks are not really helpful if it's not tailored to your specific workflow. That's why you really need to get the device, try it out for 15 days and see if it fits your specific workflow. Try to stress it out to the max and see if that works. You, after all, you have 15 days to return it. And the worst of all that YouTubers do is they do the basic export. Exporting, yes, it's pretty good. Some people say that it's a proxy to the performance, the timeline scrubbing performance, but I don't believe it. Now this device does export very slow and we're gonna talk about that, but I don't think it's a good proxy to measure how poorly it does on the timeline scrubbing experience. So let's talk about that. The scrubbing experience on the timeline, how does it feel, does it feel snappy? Well, this is where it really falls apart. Now, it is definitely possible to do edit basic videos. Like you get your 4K footage, you have one shot of you just talking, you have very few cuts, you have very few transitions, very few effects. Yes, this can definitely do the job. But if you're getting anywhere more complicated, like for example, on my channel, the types of videos I do, like side-by-side -side comparisons, stacking lots of layers, having multi-cam footage, it really starts to struggle and you can really feel the lag, especially if you compare it to my PC. Going back and forth, there is a night and day difference in terms of the responsiveness of the timeline. For example, clicking between different timelines, the simple act of going from one timeline to another, just you can feel it just feel so slow and unresponsive. Also, obviously scrubbing along the timeline, if you can see my cursor moving, it's not very responsive. You can see that the, my mouse goes faster than the actual playhead on Premiere Pro. And that's just a good indicator that it's not performing very well. On my PC, it's super fast. My mouse cursor follows the playhead all the way really fast, synch synchronized basically, and it's just a lot more reliable. Another thing I notice is that when I toggle proxies, it just takes a long time to load the footage, the real footage, and then switch back to proxies. Every interaction just feels a little bit slow. Now that's not to say things like transcribing the, the video clips that you import, which is really helpful for text-based text editing, or generating peak files, or actually opening the Premiere Pro. It all feels very snappy. In fact, opening a Premiere Pro project on the base M4 is way faster than my PC. But unfortunately, where it really matters, like interacting with the timeline, it just doesn't cut it, and it's gonna feel very slow and unresponsive. Now I noticed that the GPU is being really taxed, and this is something that I also noticed on my RTX 3070, my NVIDIA graphics card, is that as I scroll on the timeline on my PC, I can see that the GPU is working really hard, it's going up to 100%. So I, I presume that not, not only do you need really good media engines to play back the footage, you also need to have a good graphics card in order to do transformations to your footage. Let's say you apply different transformations, like you put crops or you scale the footage up, uh, make it smaller, put side by side and stuff like that that all taxes the GPU. And unfortunately, this base model only has a GPU of 10 cores. If you want something that is a little bit more reasonable, you have to upgrade to the Pro, then you get 16 cores, or you can extend that to 20 cores. But obviously what I would recommend is to get the Max and get the Studio. Unfortunately, it doesn't come in this size, so you have to get the really fat MacBook Studio. The last thing I wanna say is that this is awfully slow at exporting your footage. And you might be saying to yourself, well, if I pay myself, you know, the Delta of getting the Pro, which is an extra maybe thousand or $2,000, I can wait the extra 10 to 20 minutes. 
But if you want to get rapid iteration, let's say you want to export your video as a draft and upload it and then watch it later on your phone, doing this really quickly is a huge productivity boost. And that's something I really notice when I'm using my NVENC encoder on my RTX 3070. It just blazes through the entire timeline so fast and exports it so I can upload it really fast. And having something slow like this is really probably gonna bog you down in the long run, especially if you're starting new and then you get more advanced and you have more uh, videos you're gonna edit. This thing, you're gonna grow out of this thing really, really fast. In fact, what's really cool about having an Intel CPU and an NVIDIA card is that they can work in tandem when you're exporting out footage. QuickSync is actually taking a, a brunt of the work in terms of decoding the footage and the GPU, the NVIDIA GPU is working on the 3D transformations and stuff like that, applying the effects. So they work in tandem to make the transcoding process really fast, but also making your timeline very, very responsive. That's why ultimately I can't recommend anyone actually using Max for Premiere Pro. It's simply not optimized. Yes, if you use Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve, perhaps your, your experience will be better on this machine. But if you're like a boomer like myself and are on Premiere Pro, then I think you should really opt in for a PC, specifically Intel, any type of Intel PC from the seventh gen many, many years ago in order to have that quick sync technology and also get an NVIDIA graphics card since it's so well optimized into Premiere Pro. So to wrap this up, overall, this is not too bad in transcoding, but the timeline experience is possible. But once you get more complicated, it's gonna feel really laggy and you're gonna hate yourself. You're not gonna hate your job of editing. And then the export times are just really slow. Premiere Pro is just simply more optimized and more biased towards PC, especially Intel CPUs with quick sync technology and Nvidia, the latest 2000, 3000, 4000, and 5000 series. Now, obviously going into this, I wouldn't expect that this $700 or $600 machine would outcompete a three-year-old PC built maybe three years ago for about two, 2,500 USD. But I thought that after I heard all the magic online about the magical architecture about the M4 and the efficiency and all the video and uh, media engines in, well, the one media engine here, I thought it would stand a chance, but unfortunately it's just not good enough. Now I originally bought this as a server. I'm gonna be using this as a server for one of my applications. The single core performance in the JavaScript environment is absolutely amazing. And I thought I would try it out and use it for editing and stuff like that and it didn't work out. Also, this is a really good machine if you are primarily a coder. Let's say you do simple, not simple, but not like crazy million lines of code. You have a mono repo and you have all, like a big massive project. If you're not running VMwares and multiple different instances of Kubernetes and stuff like that, this is a great project. If you're building a React app, Android app, iOS app, everything is fast and responsive, way better than the experience on PC, especially when you use terminal and uh, like a ZS Edge like that. It's just much nicer, much better developer experience on here. The applications like Home Row and stuff and Super Whisper are all available on this platform a Mac OS platform and it's just a better developer experience. All right, so let's wrap this up. What have we learned? Now, I'm not gonna say that you cannot edit with a M4 Mac mini. It is quite a pleasant experience if you do transcode the footage. Just that little extra step, and I have a script to fully automate it because I can't stand using Adobe Premiere's media encoder. It is very buggy and sometimes it double encodes and stuff like that. So I wrote my own custom script that I will share in the description of this video and it has made my process of editing videos on the M4 mini more tolerable. However, if you do want to edit without proxies, I do recommend that you get a at least 48 gigs of memory. With Premiere Pro, I find having more memory to be very beneficial. The next thing you want to optimize is the GPU core count. So I would upgrade to the M4 Pro and get a 20 core GPU, which is the upgraded non-binned version. I've actually tested this. I got a laptop to compare with the M4 Mini. It was substantially smoother and a lot more responsive than the M4 Mini. Not by a lot, because you are, st you are still not getting the, the dual media engines, encoders, decoders, with, with what you would get with an M4 Mac Studio. Anyways, that's it for this video. If you have any questions about the Mac base Mac Mini compared to a PC from three years ago, let me know in the comment section down below, and I'll see you in the next video.